You are currently listening to or watching Prophetic News in Focus. Pro-government forces have intensified operations in the area of the Syrian capital Damascus. On October the 11th, the Syrian army and the National Defense Forces NDF seized the town of Raihan from Jaish al-Islam militants in eastern Ghouta. This allowed the government forces to lay down a siege on the strategic town of Tel Kodi and the nearby industrial area and to deploy in about two kilometers from the last major stronghold of militants in the region, Duma. Separately, the government forces launched operations to liberate the strategic Ayamuk refugee camp in southern Damascus. The camp is predominantly populated by Palestinian nationals and is now under the control of ISIS. A minor part of the camp is controlled by Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, formerly Jabhat al-Nusra. The Syrian army and groups of pro-government Palestinian militias entered the camp from the north and by October the 12th, they have seized almost the half of it. In the province of Hama, the Syrian army's Tiger Forces NDF, took control of Kaukab and al kubariya but retreated from Ma'an. By October the 12th, the army NDF have repelled a series of counter-attacks by the terrorists and now they are aiming to relaunch the operation in Ma'an. Local sources say that up to 60 terrorists, including Jaish al-Nasr commander Bassam Abu Duraid, were killed in the clashes. Clashes are ongoing in the city of Aleppo, however, no sides have achieved notable gains. The Syrian military will receive a batch of Pantsir S-1 surface-to-air missile and anti-aircraft artillery weapon systems, according to reports in Russian media outlets. Sources in the military diplomatic circles say that the systems will be delivered under the Russian-Syrian deal made in 2008. Details of the deal have not been revealed. Nonetheless, experts believe that the delivery of 36 to 50 systems and 700 missiles for them could be expected. The reason of the decision is a growing threat to deliver military strikes on the government forces by the US-led coalition. Meanwhile, the Syrian Defense Ministry confirmed that it will use all military means to repel the US aggression. This is the history of human weather modification. During World War II, too many British Air Force pilots were crashing while trying to land in heavy fog so thick, some crews just ditched their planes in the sea and parachuted out rather than landing blind. So scientists came up with a plan to install gasoline pipelines along both sides of the runway and ignite them to create huge rows of flame, which then evaporated suspended fog droplets, allowing the Allied aircraft to locate the airfield and land safely. In 1946, techniques were developed that triggered rain and snowfall in places that wouldn't have gotten any otherwise. This became known as cloud seeding. It works by dispersing dry ice, salt, or silver iodide into clouds to alter their microphysical processes. In the early 60s, the US government began testing cloud seeding on hurricanes to learn if it was possible to weaken them. Rocket canisters of silver iodide were dropped from aircraft into the storm's eye, and gun-like devices mounted on the wings also sprayed the stuff onto the clouds. Initially, the tests seemed to work, wind speeds were cut, and in some cases, the hurricane eye walls even fell apart. But as observational technology improved and more controls were carried out, the hypothesis was invalidated and the program was cancelled. In its desperation to win the Vietnam War, the Americans turned to weather modification to make it harder for the enemy to move throughout the region by inducing heavy rainfall to muddy or destroy their dirt roads and trails. 47,000 canisters of silver iodide were dropped over North and South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Some areas supposedly saw their monsoon period extended by up to 45 days, but just two days after the New York Times exposed the program, it was discontinued. Operation Popeye caused the USSR and US to negotiate a ban on the military use of offensive weather modification techniques in 1977. But the treaty didn't stop countries from using cloud seeding against themselves, as the Soviet Union did in 1986 when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster sent fallout into the sky. Civilians on the ground and the Russian pilots who carried out the mission have confirmed that aircraft flew overhead, ejecting a substance into the clouds. 
This resulted in heavy, black-colored radioactive rain to fall in Belarus instead of onto the Soviet capital, Moscow. Today, 37 countries are operating weather modification programs to enhance rainfall or suppress hail, or both. But nobody does it quite like the Chinese, who established the Bureau of Weather Modification in the 1980s that's now a 37,000 people strong sort of weather national guard, ready at a moment's notice to operate the more than 4,000 rocket launchers, 7,000 anti-aircraft guns, and 30 aircraft to trigger downpours in drier areas that really need the rain. The Bureau's highest profile operation was keeping Beijing's Bird's Nest Stadium dry during the opening ceremony of the 2008 Olympics. The following year, the Bureau dropped 186 doses of silver iodide into a cold front to bring drought-stricken Beijing its earliest snowfall since 1987. A Swiss company took advantage of the United Arab Emirates' desperation to bring rain to its arid lands by building 10-meter-tall electrical towers that produce negatively charged ions that, according to the company, supercharges the formation of rain clouds. But a former chairman at NOAA isn't buying it, saying, quote, this method is inherently incapable of producing clouds out of thin air, end quote. The thing about weather modification is that it's hard to prove it works. But based on the results we've seen, and the number of countries still doing it, man's effort to control precipitation isn't stopping anytime soon, even though we have little understanding of the unintended consequences. Representative of the White House claimed that the U.S. would proportionally respond to hacking which is allegedly connected with Russia. Josh Earnest, the White House press secretary, assured that the U.S. will definitely deliver a proportional response. He also added that the response will hardly be announced beforehand. Before that, the Department of Homeland Security, along with the director of the National Intelligence, openly accused Russia of deliberate attempts to influence the U.S. elections with the help of cyber attacks. However, the U.S. Special Services provided no proof. It should be noted that the U.S. is currently developing a plan to specify cyber attacks as an act of aggression. In case the U.S. computer systems are attacked, the President will be able to retaliate with economic sanctions, a cyber attack or even a military one. Brief reign supreme across the Muslim world as mourners observe Ashura, the day when Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, was martyred in an unequal battle. Iraq's holy city of Karbala, which is home to Imam Hussein's shrine, has drawn millions of mourners from different countries. Lebanon's resistance movement Hezbollah has warned about the U.S. plan to keep Daesh terrorists in eastern Syria. Hezbollah chief Said Hassan Nasrallah called on Iraqi leaders not to allow the Tekfiri terrorists in Mosul an escape route to Syria. He stressed Hezbollah will maintain his position in Syria. The Russian president says it is difficult to hold a dialogue with the current U.S. administration. Vladimir Putin says the Obama administration prefers to dictate matters rather than hold talks with others. He expressed worry about the relations between the two countries, adding that pressure will not work with Russia. Brazilians have held a rally to denounce the proposal by President Michel Temer to amend the Constitution. The demonstrators in Sao Paulo chanted slogans against Temer and his government. The constitutional amendment proposal is aimed at limiting government spending for up to 20 years. And lawyers for the main suspect in the deadly Paris attacks last November have decided to quit defending their client, Salah of Islam. The lawyers have not cited any reason for their decision. Abdus Salam has refused to answer questions since he was transferred from Belgium to France in April to face terror charges. Donald Trump might not follow through on his vow to appoint a special prosecutor to go after Hillary Clinton if he is elected president. That's from Kellyanne Conway, Trump's campaign manager. She says he'll wait until he's elected and then decide. At a rally in Greensboro, North Carolina, President Barack Obama smelled his own hand, checking to see if it smelled of sulfur. A conservative radio talk show host has charged the president with being a demon and smelling like one. Obama noted that Donald Trump often appears on that radio show. At the Vatican, Pope Francis renewed his appeal for an immediate ceasefire in Syria. Speaking before a general audience in St. Peter's Square, the pontiff called on those responsible to stop hostilities and allow evacuation of civilians trapped by the conflict. And in a sure sign of things to come, a strong storm hits the mountains of Croatia, dumping nearly a foot of snow. 
Roads are closed and residents are stranded as a cold spell grips the country. In North Carolina, rescuers patrolled low-lying areas Wednesday as floodwaters continued to rise following Hurricane Matthew. The state's governor says more damage is still to come for many in the east. The storm left at least 35 dead in the U.S. Samsung has begun shipping fire-resistant boxes to owners of the Galaxy Note 7 as part of the massive recall of the phone. The kit also contains safety gloves. Samsung has recalled all Galaxy S7 phones and says it's stopping production after numerous reports of batteries overheating and catching fire. A house explosion in suburban Chicago injured two utility workers Tuesday night. Authorities say the explosion stemmed from an earlier gas leak. The surrounding area was evacuated as a precaution. And in Little Rock, Arkansas, a bridge finally collapses. Workers had tried to bring the defunct bridge down with explosives Tuesday, but that didn't work. Eventually, a cable was rigged to the bridge, allowing it to be pulled down from a barge. Robert but, you know, let's talk about what's really going on here, Martha, because our intelligence community just came out and said in the last few days that the Kremlin, meaning Putin and the Russian government, are directing the attacks, the hacking on American accounts to influence our election. And WikiLeaks is part of that, as are other sites where the Russians hack information. We don't even know if it's accurate information. And then they put it out. We have never in the history of our country been in a situation where an adversary, a foreign power, is working so hard to influence the outcome of the election. And believe me, they're not doing it to get me elected. They're doing it to try to influence the election for Donald Trump. Now, maybe because he has praised Putin, maybe because he says he agrees with a lot of what Putin wants to do, maybe because he wants to do business in Moscow. I don't know the reasons, but we deserve answers. Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching. Um, today, we're going to talk about the second debate with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I want to focus on a few of the statements that uh, Hillary has made. Now, I have uh, never seen someone who is actually so good at lying as she is. Um, she's, she's lied all through this debate. I know that during a debate you can't actually fact check everything. But uh, she can't, uh, people can't let her get away with this kind, with this kind of thing. Um, now, I know Donald is no uh, angel, but he's not pushing for a war with Russia or further escalation of war in the Middle East. Um, it should be known by now that uh, the US is attacking uh, the Syrian forces. Now, when you look at this, you have to ask yourself, what will happen if Hillary is elected? In the Middle East, anyway. What will happen in the Middle East if she's elected? Now, are we talking open war with Syria? And if so, does that also mean an open war with Russia? Now, these are critical questions because the rhetoric that is coming out of her is that Putin is to blame, Russia is to blame. You know, this is the Cold War all over again. In her mind, it's it's like it's like, it's like in her mind, it's still the Cold Cold War. Um, she blames Putin and Russia for the hacks. Um, but it was her idea to set up servers in her basement and operate um, an illegal email service and uh, send classified emails illegally. Whose fault is that? Is that, is that Putin's fault? Is that Russia's fault? No. It's her own fault. But... Like I said, she's a great liar. She can deflect the focus off of herself so well. And um, I don't know if you all watched the debate. I highly recommend that you do. Um, and just focus on her. And think about what her being elected could potentially mean. And what s signals she's sending out. <clears throat> she wants war. That's all she wants. Why does she want war? Because her masters want want war. Now, Russia have uh, set up a, a missile defense system to protect the Syrian army. And I'll play you a clip where 
a, a general, a Russian general, is speaking about how uh, if there is another mistake by the Americans, um, and this being a reference to um, the uh, the bombing of uh, Syrian forces, of Assad's forces, which the Americans uh, claimed to be an accident, that now the Syrians will have a defense and that uh, they will they will take down any aircraft uh, attempting to bomb the Syrian forces. Now, if this is not an escalation in Syria, uh, I don't know what is. Um, I'm sure that Tel Aviv is seriously enjoying what's going on. If World War Three does break out, who will be fighting? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you who won't be fighting. The Jews won't be fighting. That while, while the war between West and East wages, it will just be Israel sitting back and watching. And the Jews sitting back and watching. While all the bloodshed takes place. And World War Three will basically guarantee the formation of Greater Israel. And what will Greater Israel serve as? Greater Israel will serve as the Jewish, as the capital for the Jewish New World Order. Now Hillary is pushing this plan. It's exactly what's going to happen if she's elected. World War Three, Greater Israel, Jewish New World Order. You, a vote for Hillary Clinton means exactly that. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. В ряде авторитетных западных средств массовой информации опубликованы утечки о дискуссиях в администрации Белого дома возможности нанесения ракетных и воздушных ударов по позициям сирийских войск. Рекомендовал бы коллегам в Вашингтоне тщательно просчитать возможные последствия реализации подобных планов. Сегодня на вооружении сирийской армии имеются достаточно эффективные зенитно-ракетные комплексы такие как С-200, БУК и другие системы противовоздушной обороны, техническое состояние которых за прошедший год было восстановлено. Кроме того, напомню американским стратегам, что воздушное прикрытие российских военных баз в Мимими и Тартусе осуществляется зенитно-ракетными системами С-400 и С-300, радиус действия которых может стать сюрпризом для любых неопознанных летающих объектов. Следует реально осознавать, что у боевых расчетов российских комплексов противовоздушной обороны вряд ли будет время на выяснение по прямой линии точной программы полета ракет и принадлежности их носителям. А все иллюзии дилетантов о существовании самолетов-невидимок могут столкнуться с расчаровывающей реальностью. И, наконец, самое важное. Сегодня большинство офицеров Российского центра примирения враждующих сторон работает на земле доставляют гуманитарную помощь и ведут переговоры с главами населенных пунктов и вооруженных отрядов в большинстве сирийских провинций. Благодаря их деятельности 732 населенных пункта и сотни тысяч сирийцев вернулись к мирной жизни. Поэтому любые ракетные или воздушные удары по территории, контролируемым сирийским правительством, создадут явную угрозу российским военнослужащим. И в завершении обращаю внимание о горячих того, что после нанесения 17 сентября самолетами коалиции удара по сирийским войскам в Дарезоре мы приняли все необходимые меры для исключения любых подобных ошибок в отношении российских военнослужащих и военных объектов на территории Сирийской Арабской Республики.
And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. The hits keep coming with only a month to go until Election Day. Hillary Clinton is battling new WikiLeaks and Donald Trump is battling his own party as he deals with the fallout from his vulgar comments from 11 years ago. Caitlin Burke has more on the chaos that is this election season. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump is taking aim at leadership within his own party, including House Speaker Paul Ryan, who said Monday he won't campaign with Trump anymore. I wouldn't want to be in a foxhole with a lot of these people, okay. in, by the way, including Ryan. Trump also lashed out on social media, sending out a barrage of tweets about the weak and ineffective top ranking Republicans who don't support him. He then declared that, quote, the shackles have been taken off, liberating him to fight for America the way he wants to. This after many from his party have withdrawn their support in the wake of the release of the vulgar video from 2005. Even as Trump wages war against his own party, he continues to battle Democratic opponent Hillary Clinton, his campaign this week releasing a new television ad. Hillary Clinton failed every single time as Secretary of State. Clinton, meanwhile, dealing with a new WikiLeaks release of over a thousand emails from her campaign, some of them seeming to show a close relationship with the news media, including a New York Times reporter giving the Clinton camp veto power over statements she'd made before including them in a story. Other emails showed Clinton's team mocking evangelicals and conservative Catholics. Her campaign communications director writing that many powerful conservatives are Catholic because they think it's, quote, the most socially acceptable politically conservative religion. Their rich friends wouldn't understand if they became evangelical, she added. Clinton's campaign team responded to the latest leaks by saying that they're simply an attempt by Russia to sway the election. The Russian interference in this election should be of utmost concern to all Americans. On the campaign trail, Clinton showed up on stage with Al Gore in an attempt to win over some millennial support by talking about his major issue and one that's important to many of them, climate change. I'm running against a guy who denies science, denies climate change, says it's a hoax created by the Chinese. Clinton has a lead in the polls and is now looking beyond the White House and trying to help Democrats take back the Senate as well. But Trump's not backing down and is sure to hit Clinton hard as this race enters its final stretch. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. And as you just heard, division is growing deeper in the Republican Party since the exposure of Trump's lewd comments about women. But while many are questioning their support of the presidential candidate, CBN News spoke with one pastor who says Christians should look at policy, not personality. We're not supporting a personality but a set of policies. The policies and the platform of the Republican Party this year are probably the most biblically oriented, um, pro-church kind of platform that we've had. But Jackson believes the biggest problem is not deciding who to vote for, but actually getting evangelicals to vote. Though the Christians show up or not, and only half of us are even registered to vote. And then of the half that are registered, only half vote, 25%. We're over-spiritualizing this process. I don't consider Hillary a Christian advocate. I'm not questioning her faith. I'm not considering Donald Trump as a born again believer who's 100% in the fold. I'm looking at their policies. With less than a month away election till Election Day, Christians have some big decisions they must make. A conservative Christian group has filed a federal lawsuit challenging a new Massachusetts law that would allow transgender people to use the bathroom of their choice. The Alliance Defending Freedom filed the lawsuit on behalf of four churches to protect their right to operate according to the belief that God created people male and female at birth. Meanwhile, 34,000 people signed a petition to repeal the law. So now we'll be on the state's 2018 ballot for voting. Andrew Beckwith with Keep Massachusetts Safe said, we remain committed to defending the fundamental rights to privacy and safety, particularly for women and children in our commonwealth. 